So welcome, Dr. Shiva. Welcome. Greetings. Welcome. So nice Greetings. To, to have you. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, Dr. Shiva founded Navdanya, right? The, the mm -hmm. organization that really promotes a vision for Earth democracy and many other um, organizations that help helping us to bring awareness to the planet Earth, soil, regenerative agricultural practices, many, many things. And most important to re reframe our, our position to Earth democracy and how that really is the core of, of, of what we need to reclaim in our pursuit of personal growth, which is something here at the Alchemist Kitchen in New York, we, we really aspire to as we celebrate the power of plants. So, so welcome, welcome so much. And, and we'd love you to just begin with perhaps a little overview of the work you're doing recently. And, 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 um, and then I'm going to ask you a few questions and then we'll open sure. it up. Thank yeah. you so much. So, but you know, my, my work continues and it, just like a plant, you know, a little seed takes on roots and takes on shoots and, uh, uh, you know, your work, if it's living and if it's responding to the seed and the world around us and the earth, it evolves. So, Navdanya I started because I did not accept A, the idea that seed was an invention of the poison makers you know, the Monsantos and the Syngentas wanted to own the seed through patenting. And to reach there, they wanted to do genetic engineering. I had looked at the Green Revolution in my country and done a book for the United Nations. And I said, if the chemical revolution could do so much harm, what will chemicals with genetic modification do to our plants, to our biodiversity? And I'm so glad you have the Alchemist Kitchen because I think there is a, a group that's concerned about animals and rights. But they forget that plants are intelligent, sentient beings. You know, I'm trained in physics. We had a brilliant physicist called J.C. Bose, who some claim was the founder of electromagnetic center. He started to use electromagnetism to understand the intelligence and life of plants. And he did amazing research, fat books, which are very difficult to get now. And he could make out, you talk to the plants in rude ways, the plants, you know, the, the waves change and the plant changes and plants are sentient beings, microbes are sentient beings. And so, you know, my work has evolved more and more from the seed to the mycelium because the plant wouldn't be there if there was, wasn't these amazing fungi. And just look at the miracle in a cubic inch, in a tiny cubic inch, it ate miles of this mycorrhizal fungi. So when people ask me, who are your teachers? And I say, of course, nature at large. Communities who still rule with nature, which are the indigenous communities, women, peasants, tribal women. But in nature, the three teachers from whom I've learned a lot are trees, of course, and forests. I began my life with chippo, and you know, my life has been one chippo hugging, just hugging every aspect of life, the seed, the soil, the plants, yeah. good food now, good food is under severe threat. And you know, the alchemist kitchens will become more and more important as without necessity, there is an attempt to make us believe that we have to live on fake food, lab made fake food with feedstock, which is GMO corn and GMO soya and more and more chemicals and more and more fake blood to make it look like meat and taste like meat. And I cannot understand how any human being would intentionally want to create delusion for themselves. You, know? <laughs> you want meat, eat meat. You want plants, eat good plants. Yes. So the first is trees and plants. Then of course the living seed which grows into these trees and plants, but definitely the mycorrhizal fungi. Yes. Because we, we work with organic farming. We work with organic farmers. I build the big domestic network of organic farmers and, and help them create their own markets and their little cafes. And the soils we often begin with are quite dead in terms of living organisms. And it takes one season 
of taking care of the earth and giving some of our organic matter. She gave it to us. We didn't create it. Just give a little bit back with gratitude. And the mycorrhizal fungi are right back. Yeah. And our studies show 300, 400% increase in soil microorganisms in a few years of loving care. I call organic farming a earth care. Yes. Yeah? And I see good food as a byproduct of the economy of care. It's not a production system. It's a regeneration system in which, of course, products come. And the blindness of the extractive mind to extract and extract and extract doesn't let you see that in regeneration, there's giving back and also receiving. And our work in Navdanya has shown that if we conserve biodiversity and the diversity of our plants and our seeds, and we regenerate the soil, we, we can have two times the food, good nutrition, good taste, good health, than what the world needs. So the idea that nature's rights and our rights are in competition is such a false illusion of the idea of separation that we are separate from the earth. And our research, health parika, wealth parika, our farmers, without chasing money and the market, are earning more than those who chase the money and the market. So we need a real rethink on economics. We need a big rethink on food, which is why so, I'm so glad you're with, we are with you. And we are, of course, here with the, on the occasion of the release of a resistance report we did last year uh, on this one billionaire who was just all over the place. You look at anything that's going crazy and you've got Bill Gates. I said, OK, 10 years, 20 years of my life was taken up by the Monsantos of the world. And I call Gates the new Monsanto. And TK, I will, <laughs> um, I will work, yes. you know, uh, yeah. to make sure that the, the evil, evilness of destroying the earth intentionally through geoengineering, green drive, genetic engineering, fake food, why choose all the wrong options when we yeah. have all the beautiful options? So the report, Philanthrocapitalism and the Erosion of Democracy, has just been published by Visinergetic, which is the reason we are here yes. together. Yes. And yes. Um, I'm, I'm glad for many reasons we are talking, Lou. Yeah. Yes. You know, the, the, it's so interesting because I think, I think most of us are really looking to how to become good custodians, right? Good, good stewards of the earth whether it's in how we consume, what we can do for, uh, for personal growth. But, and so I, I, I wonder in the context of, you know, the Monsantos and even Bill Gates, who for many, I think, have in, has enjoyed a certain amount of trust, right, in his point of view because of his success in, uh, and, and, and so how, how do we, how, how do we start to begin taking the steps we need as consumers, you know, to become better custodians, you know, better citizens of this earth um, in, in, and what are some tips that we should, as a result of this conversation, some tips uh, to become more mindful, you know, of what we need to do because of, it's so overwhelming, right? In the one yeah. sense. So uh, let me share with you, Lou, a story of my childhood. So I've grown up in, in India in the transition. You know, we were totally fossil fuel free. We were chemical free. We were plastic free. Everything was handmade. Everything was natural. And then the petrochemicals came. And the first fake fiber called nylon came. And of course, it was fashionable because they make it fashionable. And all our friends were wearing these nylon props. They were called glass nylon because they were horrible, you know? Yes. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't a nice fiber. Yes. But everyone was wearing it. And you know, as a six, seven year old, you kind of feel you've got to be in the group. And so when our mother asked, what would you like? And my sister and I said, a nylon frock. And she said, of course I'll get it for you if you're really serious about having it. But just remember each time you wear it, you got a rich man, his next Mercedes car. <laughs> and if you wear Khadi, which is the hand spun, hand woven cloth that Gandhi revived as part of our freedom struggle. And I took inspiration from his spinning wheel idea of the spinning wheel in millions of hands is the most powerful instrument against the empire. And we did 
shed the empire and became free through spinning cotton and spinning hand woven cloth. So uh, she said, and if you wear that, a woman could feed her children that night. You make the choice. And you know, my mother put this burden on us when we were very young. Wow. And I've never been able to touch fake clothing, fake food, because my mind immediately unravels to what yeah. does it do for the earth? What does it do to the producers? Yeah. How many species did it destroy? How much creative work of hands did it rob? And therefore our daily act of beginning with just two simple things of how we eat and what we eat and what we wear. These are the two biggest burdens on the planet. And they're the two biggest livelihood sources. They're also the two biggest greed attractors right now. Yes. And as our report in, uh, on philanthropic capitalism shows, every aspect of the food system, from the seed to how we grow it, agriculture, to how we process it, fake food, all of this. You know, the big billionaires are looking at it, so we could make them a lot of money, you know. That's what Monsanto thought, if I have patents on every seed, how much money I'll make, and that's how they got rich. And that's why we have GMO corn, GMO corn, GMO soya, GMO corn, GMO soya, and every industrial food stuff. Now they're looking at if we can fake everything, can you imagine? And I, I get amazed at how they can even get away with, you know, coffee without coffee beans. Yes. Agriculture without farmers, food without farms, Mozzarella without buffalo, you know. Um, do you, do you and think, think, yeah, yeah. No, do you think that is there an opportunity where technology, in a more mindful way, can become an ally to the small farmer, to the, to, or or is it your thinking that the the farmer needs to really just pay attention to the history and the traditions of. Yeah growing you know yeah so i'm you know i'm trained originally in nuclear physics and then yes, i'm trained quantum, in the foundation quantum, of quantum right? theory yeah. so you know i i have made i made a choice to go deep into science and technology what has happened in our times really just literally in in these 20 years of globalization and even more in the last 10 years suddenly we say technology we say tech but that's a meaningless phrase because a true accurate phrase would be, here's a technology to do this. Yeah? When you work in a kitchen, you know that this is a spoon that lifts food yeah. and this is a pan that cooks it. You don't call the spoon technology, do you? And you don't call the pan technology, yeah? Yes. But they are technologies. They yes. are yes. technologies. Yes. 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 So to say technology, without specification or what does it do is totally inaccurate. It's like, you know, me being pushed to wear that gla uh, glass nylon frog uh, with the term, it's technology. My mother was sensible enough to make me aware that every tool has a system behind it. Yeah. So the issue is what system do you choose? And within that system, what tools are beneficial for the earth? What tools are beneficial for the farmers? What tools are beneficial for our health? So I think we should stop using the anonymous word technology yes. and bring it to its original meaning. Techni, from which technology is derived, means yes. tools. Yes. Tools need tools. assessment and tools need choice. Yes. And the minute you have no assessment, technology becomes religion. Yes. And you have no choice, technology becomes dictatorship. So I'm against the shedding of the two qualities that each technology should carry. <laughs> I'm also very critical about making nature's technologies and making people's technologies go invisible. I'll give you a very simple example. We are living through horrendous climate disasters. We've just had a Glasgow COP last year. Yes. And one of the big things being pushed was carbon capture technologies. Yeah. And I wrote an essay then, and it's available on our website. I said, here's the lovely green leaf. You, it gets the sunlight. And in that leaf is the technology through photosynthesis to take the carbon dioxide 
turn it into the food we eat and the oxygen we breathe. So here you have these giant $1 billion plants that are only able to take out one or 2% of the pollution that they claim they will do and are not living systems. The beauty of the plant as a technology of carbon capture is, is not, not only that it increases and grows by the day, it gives us food and oxygen as a byproduct while it's capturing carbon. And it reduced the temperature of this planet from 290 degrees to 13 degrees. That's wow. the technology we need to follow. Yes. Yes. That's why I, I, you know, oh, but here's technology. Well, just because you've got heavy machinery to, you know, you spend a billion on a thermal power plant and another billion on carbon capture. And, you know, the billionaires are looking at $15 trillion of tax money to subsidize this absurdity. So I say, well, look at nature's technologies. Of yes. course, I'm a believer of technology, but I am a critic of blindness, domination, dictatorship. Yes. And, and you know, it's a good, good segue into the concept that, that I think we were interested in, which is that nature works on the principle of diversity and expression, right? Mm -hmm. And that, yes. that, that we're fooled, right? Because this commodification of standardizing um, inhibits our real identity and relationship with plants and nature as this, this, this spirit of uniqueness and diversity. Well, we could learn so much from that as well, you know. Yeah, I've, you know, just received a fat book and had to pay a lot of customs duty for it. Where, <laughs> you know, UNESCO asked me, UNESCO put out this fat volume on diversity, yeah? The fat volume the Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity. And I've written the essay on how biological diversity and cultural diversity go hand in hand. Yes, diversity is the organizing principle of life and freedom. And what industrialism did, and later what the industrialization of agriculture did, was because it was based on external inputs of fossil fuel based chemicals, it had to create uniformity, not because uniformity is the way nature works. Nature works with diversity. Nature abhors uniformity. Monocultures were created for external inputs to sell chemicals. And whether it was forest monocultures or fish monocultures or agriculture monocultures, my work on the Green Revolution is what taught me that. My work with Chipko, the movement on forestry taught me that. And and they don't produce more, yeah? And I've called this the monoculture of the mind. I said, how is it? Here's a rich forest. And they put these pathetic eucalyptus plantations for pulpwood. And they say, this is more productive than that. A, a biodiverse rainforest with 2000 species. And yeah. they say, it's not productive. And then I, when I've had debates on this, they say, oh, but those are clearly weeds because they're not commercially exploitable. You can't turn them into commodities. Yeah. So commodification creates a monoculture of the mind, which then imposes monocultures on the earth. Yes. Same idea imposes monocultures on society because you know if every part of India is a different kind of shawl, and you know I'm still following my mother. Six, six year old <laughs> lesson. I, I will only wear things made handmade. You know this is beautiful woven shawl from the desert. You know with beautiful glass look at the inlay and it's That's only beautiful. love yeah. it's only love and the creation of beauty yes. that that allows this to happen uh, so the monoculture of the mind is our real poverty and yeah. we have to i think we have to resonate with the earth which strives towards maximizing diversity so that our minds become a biodiversity of the mind yes. and our minds were and our creativity resonates with the creativity of the earth that is where we cultivate hope that's where we create our abundance that's where we get rid of all scarcities all the, and illusions of scarcity and the realities of scarcity because every the yeah yeah There's the fear we we have a fear of scarcity right that yeah, uh, yeah. You know that we have a fear that the, that the small farmer, you know, cannot really feed the world. You know, there is a there is, and I think that's a propaganda, you know, 
perpetrated, right, by the this this monoculture that we are fighting, right. you know, to to evolve past, you know. So. It is very much propaganda, and this is the reason I spent the last forty years of my life assessing small biodiverse farms and industrial monoculture farms, and the biodiverse farms produce, you know, sometimes twenty times more. Nutrition. So we said yield per acre is an empty commodity measurement. Yeah. What is in the food? What's the quality? Whether it has nutrition or it has taste? No. How much does it weigh? Now, now that is the ultimate Cartesian reductionism. How, what does it taste like is the true quality. <laughs> yes. and, right. and taste, interestingly, as my dear friend uh, Seralini has shown, taste is about quality because those amazing phytochemicals in the plants start singing with our gut microbiome. Yes. And the gut microbiome then triggers the sense perceptions that we start thinking of taste. But it is in the biodiversity that came from the soil organisms that went into the plant that we then eat and that is the quality that we yes. taste. And uh, this is what I would call the resonance between us and nature. And that has to be the quality of how we start consuming in ways that regenerate the earth, that make sure more and more, I, you know, I really believe we don't overcome the industrial definition of productivity, which says the fewer the people, the more productive a system is. But they don't look at how much energy you're using. So using 500 times more energy to produce the same thing, and Amory Lovins called it energy slaves. Yes. So yeah, we are saying it's more productive, get rid of people, we are creating unemployment. Yes. And we are using more energy slaves to create climate havoc. And the quality of what we are getting out every day gets more and more inferior. You know, yes. in my country, I have watched, you know, I, right here around my shoes, my ancient shoes made of leather are still working. The new materials of fake leather are just disintegrated. You yeah, know, it's quite amazing. They just disappeared. Just, the soles have gone. The top has gone. And, you know, for me, yes. regeneration is about lasting things, you know, yes. things that last. Good yes. clothing, good food that doesn't have good to last indigo. because good sadly indigo. it's the chemical food that lasts. <laughs> but, um, you know, I had a friend, Jyoti, who, who gave us this anecdote. They said, the food in the West is so contaminated with chemicals that the dead bodies aren't being eaten, you know, and they're just sitting there, you know, because they're preserved. They're preserved yes. with chemicals. So yeah, some things should recycle yes. and the usable things should last a little longer and still be recyclable. You know, I can turn this into a mop once it's torn, yes. but I, it won't be for, you know, it's I think already 30 years old. I think I can <laughs> use it another 20 while I last. The shawl yeah. will last as long as I last. You know, we have a we we have a we have a groundswell here um, taking place. You know, it's where there's a narrative that the for gro for healing uh, and and helping decondition this 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 uh, virus that we have of of how we see the planet and how we've been raised. You know, with the use of uh, psychedelic plants. You know. And, and indigenous getting back into to a way in which to revisit our indigenous roots, you know? Uh, there's quite a bit, uh, quite a bit, quite an interesting narrative underway. And I, I wondered what your thoughts were of as, as the more these kind of are, are very privileged, you know, we're very privileged here in the United States, most, most of us. And we, well, there is a there is this movement of using medicinal mushrooms, using psychedelic mushrooms, um, in in ceremony to somewhat awaken our consciousness. The consequence of is wanting to be closer to the earth, living living closer to the earth, having having a um, a reconnection. And I wondered, you know, wh wh which is based in the power of plants, right? And I, and I and 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 fungi and I, I wondered is you know there is is that an optimistic kind of illusory anticipation that we could um, imagine more and more people using plants to raise and change their consciousness, change their awareness, to become 
better leaders, better influencers over this, this, this activism? Yeah. No, plants definitely shape our consciousness anyway, because as the old women in the villages will say to me, we are what we eat, you know? Jesa Anna, Anna is food, Jesa Anna, Wesa Man, you know? We are what we eat. Now, if you're going to eat junk, you know, your mind will be let out. And we, in India, we have a very beautiful concept of differentiation of energy. Energy is not just energy, you know? On everything, whether it's food or energy, we always distinguish between the sattvic, which is the regenerative, the rajsic, which makes you hyper. And then we have the tamsic, which makes you heavy. Yeah. So a lot of the industrial foods are really making everything heavy. It's a, you know, a, yeah. one, one could, one could talk about it as dissipative energy, you know, degrading energy. Uh, this much my own work has shown me yes. that diversity, just like diversity is the organizing principle of nature and life. Diversity is the organizing principle of healthy food and healthy eating. So we need diversity of eating and diversity of plants and diversity of relationships with plants. Yes. And during this COVID time, because I work with rural women, we save seeds, we do organic farming. And I created 20 years ago, a movement called Gardens of Hope because I was watching farmers growing GMO cotton, getting into debt, committing suicide. And I said, this has to stop. And the widows who were left were getting into such despair. So I said, you've lost your husband, you've lost your land, but you still have this little patch next to your heart. Let's make a garden. And, you know, just from that to create yes, a yes. garden of hope. And it was beautiful during, you know, the lockdown, I would have calls and, uh, and the calls would always say how I never got COVID because there was this plant and this plant and this plant my mother used to use or my grandmothers used to use to build immunity. And all that forgotten knowledge was getting resurrected during COVID. Our communities did not get COVID. Wow. And they, they ensured yeah. the building, they, they reclaimed because you know, there is those who, who want to make us feel hopeless, want us to forget there's something like a body's immunity in terms of how you treat it. You know what they call the natural immunity. They want to get the word natural immunity out, just like they tried to make us forget that soil with mycorrhizae has fertility. They made us think only the fertilizer from, you know, from fossil fuels, that yeah. only that brings fertility. Or, and I've debated this, you know, with the Monsantos of the world, I've been in court with them, that the farmer's seed has no fertility, has yes. no productivity. It's only what they do to it that gives it value, productivity, and everything. So this idea of an empty, you know, it's, I take, I extend the idea of terra nullius, the empty land that was used to colonize the lands of indigenous people. I've used bio nullius to say that's how they're trying to colonize the seed and the plants. Yes. And, um, and just like land was never empty, and yes. indigenous people have preserved the richest biodiversity. The 25% land where they are is 80% of the biodiversity of the planet. They know how to live with plants. Yes. And, and the biodiversity itself, you know, this is my simple learning. Yes. Food my is the currency of life because food is what moves around. Nutrition is what moves around. And the biodiversity of food is what makes the soil richer the plants richer and our gut richer. And we are into beings. We are not a separate privileged superior species. And then the human species superiority increases if you're a man, it increases if you're white. No, that's an illusion. We are an earth family. That's why I talk about a democracy, an earth family. And in the earth family, there is no one who's less and no one who's more. Who could say the mycorrhizal fungi isn't significant. It is what carries us. And, and then, then you realize that we are 90% other species. We are walking microbes and walking myromes. And this idea of panicking with 90% of ourselves is a very wrong way of thinking. Just like it was wrong to think every insect must be killed with pesticides and every wonderful plant that comes on its own should be killed by Roundup and herbicide. I think this extermination idea it's a very violent idea. 
yes. and loving the diversity that thrives around us, knowing more about it, knowing more about its symbiosis and using it in loving, caring, respectful ways is the shift we need. That's, that's great. Well, we're going to, I'm so appreciative of that. I think that we're going to open the, up to some questions because I really want to give as uh, I, I can really like to begin to, to do this. The, 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 the first one, uh, yeah, I, th I think there, there's a, a question here about, could you, could you talk a bit about the Ayurvedic, uh, you know, the Ayurvedic, um, uh, mindset, you know, the, which, which also has become more popular, right? These, 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 these concepts of around diet and the Ayurvedic, um, how, how can we learn from this, from this history of, of yeah. food and balance and experience from, from those principles? I wouldn't call it history, Lou. I'd call it a living tradition. Living tradition. Okay, thank you. So that much. is still alive and thriving. Yeah. Yes. And it's more than 5,000. Some say 5,000, some say 10,000. So Ayurveda means life. Veda means the science. The science of life is what Ayurveda is. And <laughs> yeah, and it so clearly says, and food is central to life. Annam, food. Sarva Oshadi, the medicine for everything, the right eating and the right food is the way to guarantee good health. Um, like my own training in quantum theory, where you don't have, you know, a glass with this much weight and this much dimension, there are no things in quantum theory. What you have is potential. Yeah. And the same is the quality of Ayurveda that everything is a potential. And the potential is interaction of three qualities, yeah, the three doshas. And how they interact with each other is what makes you a balanced body and a healthy body or not. And diet can aggravate you know, many of the diseases and therefore the diet becomes central to healing. Uh, but it's not only diet, there's so many sub aspects to Ayurveda. And the beauty is now they're discovering the gut microbiome in the last 10 years. But Ayurveda was talking about the fact that it's the gut that is the, the central organ to determine how you, whether you have well being or not. And for the gut's own health is the food you eat. So Ayurveda is the medicine of the past and medicine of the future. And um, it is focused so much on building the body's own capacity. Yeah? Yes. The, the wonderful thing about systems like Ayurveda is they recognize the body is alive. Yeah? And it is healing if it's sick. Whereas mechanistic views of the world and the body basically assumes it's just a machine and it has to be fixed. Yeah? Living systems get healed and regenerated. Inert mechanical systems get broken down and fixed. We don't need fixing. We need healing. The earth doesn't need fixing of geoengineering. The earth needs love and healing. Yes. Well, you know, it's season of love, you know, with we, we, we call February season of love because on the one hand, we have the commodified, you know, Valentine's Day and, and to kind of uh, we always look at February as a season of love. So, you know, it's a good, a good segue into, you know, how, uh, what does love mean to you and how, how can we uh, serve Mother Earth in a loving way? I mean, so much of your work really is dedicated to that. So it's kind of a big question, but in the se this particular season, you know, before we go into our season of plantings, you know, we, we have these themes. So we're in season of love. So that's a question of how, what does it mean to serve mother earth and in a loving way? And um, perhaps you could give us a couple of tips, you know? <laughs> I think the first thing to know about mother earth is she's living. And I think that is the knowledge that's been killed with the violence of industrialism. The earth is dead matter, raw material. This is what I've been debating all day, yeah? The earth is not dead matter. The biodiversity is not raw material for exploitation. The earth is living. The earth is a being. 
That's why they call her Gaia. Yeah, she's an organism. You know, just like our gut has microorganisms, the Earth as a whole is an organism. Every species on the Earth is a living organism, self-organized. So, what is love? Love is awareness of the life yes. of the plant or the Earth as a whole, and with that awareness a consciousness that you must care. And what is care but giving? And how do we care for the earth? We care for the earth by giving to her a little bit of her gifts. That's what organic farming is. That's what regeneration is. That's what everything that's being talked about right now. But that was what was broken with industrial agriculture, where chemicals from the war and Hitler's labs from IG Farben came into agriculture's agrochemicals. For me, love, besides care, is doing no harm. Doing no harm. Doing no harm. Therefore, I mean, you, you, you cannot even use chemicals in farming because they're war instruments, you know? So the minimum you do yeah. is get rid of chemicals and shift to organic. Um, and when you do no harm, then the earth herself rebounds so beautifully. And at least that's my learning, you know, especially at our farm. I've learned so much. You know, this, this powerful masculinist idea of I'm in control, I make this run, I do that, I do this. And that's what this book, Philanthrocapitalism, is all about, the ultimate empire builders. No, the earth needs love and service and care because she is more powerful than us. This and she's true. our mother and we depend on her. So how can we be imagining that we are more powerful than her? You know, you know, you're, a very, you, you know you're, ve you're a very potent influencer on many young people who are reaching a place of wanting to feel that they're taking, becoming activists, right? The, be the becoming of an activist which is a liberation in a way, it's an expression of identity. What, 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 when you speak, when you, when you speak around the world and you're confronted with, with this question of how, what, what do I do to, to, to become an activist? Well, what, what, what is my, what, with all humility, what, what can I do? What, what, what should be, what, what is that message these days that you, encourage those who are influenced by your work, particularly in the area of eco-activism, uh, particularly by women these days? You know? Yeah, the, so the first thing is, you know, if we are all potential, then we are all power. And the power to act is activism. We have a beautiful word for it in Hindi, Shakti, the power to act. And that's what we call all our women farmers and activists, yes. you know? And I always say, you know, what do you do? Shakti. 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 Shakti is the power to act. Shakti, yeah. the embodiment of that yes. power to act. And we have to just know that we have that power. So awakening to your own power. And, you know, when a lot of people say, oh, you work a lot on empowering women. I said, no, I don't work on empowering women. They are power. I work on preventing the disempowerment ah. through destructive power. So that's the second element of activism to come in the way of destruction and disempowerment. Um, and that's in a way that, you know, the symbol of chippo, of hugging. I'll come in the way of your axe that kills the tree. That's my love for the earth. Yes. You know, that's where this idea of hugging the tree hugging that you want tree, to protect, like the tree. that you come in the way of destruction. So you have potential, you have power. And you have the power to not let the forces of destruction go unchallenged. Yes. All of us are in different places. All of us have different potential. Some of us are good artists. Some of us are good writers. Some of us are good scientists. Some of us are good teachers. Some of us are good farmers. Some of us are good cooks. And it doesn't matter where in the creative web of life you put your service. Yes. Yeah? It will bloom with the web of life. Thank you for that. I have a question from Evelyn. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Food System Summit 2021 and are we on the right track? 
There was no food system summit in the original form of a food system summit. Okay. Food system summits were held. Food summits were held in Rome, which is the seat of the Food and Agriculture Organization, which is the body that is dedicated in the UN system to food and agriculture. Now, this is the body that has one country, one vote, and it also has the participation of civil society. That's the reason this body has been able to do two things. One, recognize there's something called agroecology, regenerative farming, and two, recognize that 80% of the food we eat comes from small farms. So what is called the Food System Summit, we could call it the Bill Gates Summit. We could call it the Philanthrocapitalism Summit because Gates hijacked it to Rome. What did that mean? It meant countries lost their democracy. That's why we talk of erosion of democracy. Instead of one country, one vote, you had one billionaire and all the votes. Right. Second, and he appointed the lady who works on chemical agriculture for him in Africa, Agnes Kanabida, as the leader. Yeah? But basically he hijacked the UN and hijacked the FAO, changed the location, got rid of the democracy. And the first is instead of partnering with chefs, partnering with farmers, whom did they partner with? Crop life, which is not about crops and it's not about life. Oh this my. is the poison cartel that makes all the poisons that kill. They were the leaders in the summit. So unfortunately, when you ask me, what do I think about it? I say, it didn't exist. There was no food system. It was anti-food, anti-democracy, anti-system. It was a corporate hijack, a billionaire hijack of the most vital element that circulates in life and the most vital aspect of human life too. Food is the most basic of our needs. Yes, yes. Uh, and by the way, you know, we putting the book, uh, the Synergetic per, uh, book, um, and, and uh, there, there's another book also I want to really encourage you guys to get, which is called Reclaiming the Commons, also a very lovely book that uh, I think Synergetic also published. So uh, you can look at the chat. Yeah, and, and we, yeah Lou, please. if I could just add, and sure. they are bringing out my consolidation of all my work on ecology and biodiversity over the oh. last 35 years. Yes. I think March they will bring out a book on agroecology and regenerative agriculture. Oh, terrific. Okay, so- And for those of your listeners, especially the young people who want to know where do you begin? You know, we've been doing for 20 years a course on the A to Z of ecological agriculture. And I call it now the return to the earth course. You know, how do we learn to return to the earth? And we do it in October. And if you go to the Navdanya Earth University website, you will find the announcement of the course. Or other we'll courses. We'll put that in the it. chat. We'll put that in yeah. our chat for people. To and sign. you know, I'm, I'm doing a course on ecofeminism now in the lead up to the International Women's Day. I think from six to eight of March. So okay. we offer these Earth University courses, and Earth University is what it says: a university of the Earth, where you learn from the Earth for the well, Earth, so that we can serve her better. Well, we want to encourage everyone. Please, this is this is your way to participate and support the work. Uh, of Dr. Shiva. You know, as we head into the spring here in the Northeast, you know, I really wanted to kind of end this phenomenal, great chat with, you know, what, what, what seeds could we go out and plant this, this season in, and, and plant in the earth to remind us that we need to, to be strong fighters, but we need to give back, you know, and, and, um, are, are there favorite herbs or, or seeds that you, you, you recommend that is an easy way for us to all take an action that give us a sense of connection, you know? Lou, it would be so irresponsible of me <laughs> to talk about what to grow in New York or, you know, in the Northeast. Uh, I, I, I don't know. The plants there, I don't know what will grow in the season. I know what's growing on our farm right now. We grow more than 2000 varieties and the mustard is blooming in, in yellow and the radishes are blooming and we have the orange and the black carrots and we have 250 varieties of wheat 
and wow. hundreds of varieties, hundreds of varieties of beans. Uh, so if you were in India, I'd tell you what to go out. Okay, so okay. it's not sowing season. But <laughs> in any case, I would say to everyone who's joined you, adopt one seed, one seed, any. And even if you don't have land, take a pot where a little sunlight comes and put it there and, and say, I will take care of you. And I really do believe that you start committing yourself to one seed and one plant, then your love and relationship with all seeds and all plant goes. So I don't think it's an accident that in India, we have this beautiful plant called the tulsi in every front yard or backyard. Little tulsi, the sacred basil. Yes. And there's a beautiful uh, poem to the tulsi, you know, when the women take care of it, go around it, pray for it in the morning. And, and basically it says, you know, earth, you are so big. And I want to take care of all of you, but I'm a little person. So I will take care of this tulsi telling myself that you, the earth, is embodied in it. And I will love it and care for it just as much as I love you. So take your one plant and make it your tulsi. Oh, and, then, and then to find out what to grow, you know, talk to the native people there, talk yeah. to the farmers in your area, you know, talk to those who know, talk to someone ignorant like me. I'm you know, sitting here in India. Yeah, <laughs> the message is not the seed is a lovely message because I'll say, and you can create intimacy. And I think coming out of COVID, uh, anything we can do as a collective community that are following this ethos, the adopting a seed is a lovely, a lovely message. And we're so, you know, we're so appreciative. We know your time is valuable. I want to thank everybody uh, that has joined the, 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 the um, we, we want you to really encourage you to, you know, check these books out and, and put them into your library and share them and take notes. And we really uh, thank you, Dr. Shiva, so much. Thank you, Lou. And so my love to everyone who joined. Yeah, we're thank so you. appreciative of, of your work and your time. And we are here and we are looking every day to support this great movement and with an optimistic and a, an appreciation for gratitude and giving back to the Mother Earth. Thank you so much. Have a lovely thank you. rest of your day. I think eating, eating in a mindful way is yes. part of that cycle of gratitude. All right. Yeah. yeah. Thank That's you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye now.